Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 338, Finance Friday Edition, where we interview James and Bianca and talk about large student loan debts, early retirement, and real estate investing, like always. One thing is like, I'm fearful of creating just a new job for us, right? Like right now we're doing all the maintenance, we're doing all the, all the property management, everything. It's all us. And so it, it feels like time is tight already. And so I always have this fear of growing and figuring out systems to make sure that we're not just creating a new job on top of our jobs we already have. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen. And with me as always is my thoughtful co-host, Scott Trench. Thank you, Mindy. Great to be here. Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else. To introduce you to every money story, because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you're starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate, start your own business, or pay off hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loan debt, we'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so you can launch yourself towards those dreams. Okay, Scott, this is actually one of my favorite episodes ever, and it didn't start off that way. We have a guest, we have two guests actually, who have quite a bit of student loan debt. And when I was first reviewing their numbers, I thought, this is a really big problem. As we started talking to them, I realized that they have an income-based repayment plan, but they make a lot of money. And at first I was like, hmm, this is interesting. And then we started talking to them and the whole situation kind of changes. The way that we were going to go, the direction we were going to go in actually gets changed quite a bit. So this is, if I can hear people saying, oh, I don't want to listen to income-based repayment programs. This is an awesome episode. This, we went in a completely different direction than what our guests were expecting and really opened their eyes to different opportunities. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the elephant in the room when it comes to James and Bianca's financial situation is Bianca's student loan debt. Now, because she took on so much so much student loan debt and has a, a relatively modest income relative to the size of that debt burden, they actually separate their finances. They feel trapped in their current location, um, and they're waiting 19 to 24 years for the repayment programs to come in, and they're worried about an income-based for, uh, problem for, from a forgiveness perspective. After 19 years, some of that loan, those loans may be forgiven. And because they're not federal programs, um, that that those re, that repayment program may actually count as income for Bianca. So major long-term problems. I think we were able to avoid those entirely based on their financial situation. And I hope that this is eye-opening for folks that are in similar situations or who may find themselves in similar situations in a few years. Scott, I just love this episode because very soon in the beginning of this show, we change tunes and it's it's just a lot of fun. Now, from my attorney, the contents of this podcast are informational in nature and are not legal or tax advice and neither Scott nor I nor Bigger Pockets is engaged in the provision of legal tax or any other advice. You should seek your own advice from professional advisors, including lawyers and accountants regarding the legal tax and financial implications of any financial decision you contemplate. All right, let's bring in Bianca and James. James and Bianca have a fairly good financial situation until you look at the debt. Bianca was a human chiropractor and took some additional coursework to become an animal chiropractor. She's sitting on about $278,000 in student loan debt, which has been in forbearance for the last few years, but will go back to about 6.8% interest once the repayment pause is lifted. But back to the good. They have 10 cash flowing rental units across four properties. They spend significantly less than they earn, and their only debt is mortgages and that pesky little student loan thing we talked about. Bianca and James, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you for having us. us. I'm super excited to talk to you today. Before we jump into that, let's look at your numbers. You make a whopping $17,310 a month, and this is across both salaries, bonuses, and rental property cash flow. Yay, that is a great. Yeah, that's that's after deductions, yes. That is, uh, yeah, that's net income. 
their expenses are $7,300. So approximately saving $10,000 a month, which is fabulous. I do see some room for improvement on those expenses. We have a car at $765 a month. That includes gas, insurance, maintenance, registration, like all of those things. But it's still $765 a month. And if we're going to round up, that's almost $1,000. Clothing at $250. Dogs at $360, entertainment at $825, gifts $500, groceries $845, healthcare $265, miscellaneous needs $300, personal care $570, travel $2415, I think I see a place we can cut, uh, utilities $260. For a grand total of $7,300, $7,355, again, you're making $17,000 a month, not a year, a month. So spending $7,000 isn't such a big deal until we go back to the beginning where we have that $278,000 uh, student loan. So I'm not done. I've got more, more things to talk about. Um, we have a, that's $99.55 left over, which is not really uh, left over. I think that number can be a bit misleading because you've been using it lately to cash flow one of the rehabs on your properties. Um, investments, we have a 401k for James at 120,000, HSA at 4,000, traditional IRA at 298,000, Roth IRA at 59,000, after tax brokerage at 368,000, cash savings at 105,000, which normally I would be like, wow, that's a lot of money in cash, but you do have 10 units over four rental properties. So I think that that's maybe a smidge high instead of like grossly high. Um, subtotal on that is $954,000, which I think is really great allocated, uh, very, very diverse. Four rental properties total $1.5 million. Hooray for you. Bianca has $7,000 in her Roth IRA, $14,000 in her brokerage account, $5,000 in cash for a total of $26,000 in total investments. But you put those all together and you have $2.5 million. So it seems like you're doing fairly well. We go back over to the debt side and we have $847,000 in debts for a grand total of $1.6 million in net worth. So again, it seems like you're doing fairly well once we don't look at those student loans. Why is healthcare so expensive? We have a shortage of healthcare and then it's so expensive to become a healthcare provider. It seems kind of... Uh, like that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Hey, it's so expensive. We're not going to allow you to get in there and and learn this. Um, so of course, the challenges that I see are the student loans. And clearly, if you are allocating so much to that travel fund, you probably like to travel. <laughs> so Bianca and James, what can we help you with today? Well, I, I think there's a couple things and you hit the nail on the head. Obviously, the student loans are a big part of what's out there and, and it's been weighing on us and how to handle it. We've got some ideas um, based on the, the program that Bianca's on for repayment. Uh, but also, I, I think that you know we're looking at three to four years to try to find a little more flexibility in what we're doing. I don't dislike my job, but it's not something that lights me up every day. It's not something that I go to work and I just can't wait to do. And I know that if we look to do something else, it's going to mean a, a big step back in salary, right? I mean, it, because I'd be leaving the industry that I'm in completely to, to look for something new. And uh, to be able to do that, I want to make sure that we're in a solid position. I don't think either of us has a dramatic urge to retire in the next couple of years. I don't think that's what we're looking for. But understanding that our income could potentially dramatically decrease if I were to explore something else, uh, I, you know, we, we want to make sure we're in a good position going forward. Sure. Okay. So let's talk about the student loan repayment plan. Yeah. So I'm on an income driven repayment plan. Um, we spoke to some, some consultants, some con consultants. Yeah. Um, to kind of figure out the best path forward with that. Cause obviously it's quite a lot of debt. Um, so currently on an income driven repayment plan, um, started working with them during the pandemic. But um, basically, my income-driven repayment plan allows me to pay as little as possible. I'm paying after after forbearance ends here. I'll be paying close to zero dollars a month or very low. Um, and then after 25 years, my debt will be forgiven, um, but I will have to pay 
interest or excuse me, I'll have to pay income tax on the on the amount that was forgiven. So I've been saving for that, putting money away each month um, and just kind of prepping for that giant tax bill at the end. Um, but still, there's a lot of fear and anxiety around, is that plan going to work? Is this the best plan forward? Um, what should we be doing? How, how far away is the 25-year forgiveness event? So the loans are split uh, technically between two loans. The first one is about 19 years away, and that's yeah. really going to be, I think I think that one's the bigger, the bulk of it. It's about uh, 200 and it's the most of it. It's over 200. There's about 50 or excuse me, 70 with the uh, interest left for the other one. And that one is additional five years. So looking at like 24 years. Just just to kind of fr- fr- uh, frame what I understand here, the goal here is for James to have flexibility with, uh, in a general sense, specifically to pursue entrep- an entrepreneurial venture, it sounds like in the next couple of years. Is that is that really the high level goal here? And to deal with the student loans in the context of that? I think so. I think that that level of flexibility, while also hopefully not taking a huge hit to our lifestyle or, or you know, we're looking for whatever that path is to be at least semi location independent too, right? Because we have we have family and friends across the country wouldn't mind living by for bits of times. So it, we're also trying to keep that in mind with whatever path we go forward with. Great. And, and let's let's call it some good here. Um, if I were to frame your situation at a high level, l- let's pretend that the student loans are just part of your rental property portfolio for a second, right? So you have if you include them in that, you've got eight hundred and forty seven grand in debts against a one point five million dollar rental portfolio. That's not so bad, and your blended interest rate on that is usually three percent for the, the the mortgages and six six and a half seven percent on the six point eight percent on the student loans. Is that right? That that's right in yep. in exact terms, but there is some caveats to that uh, percentage on on the student loans. The program that she's on, the government offers a. Uh, forgiveness on the negative amortization that occurs each year. So the fact that she's not paying really anything, and then we have the interest at the end of the year, they actually forgive 50% of that. So really, it's a 3.4% equivalent interest rate, which kind of changes the picture as to, you know, what do we do? Because, you know, when you get start start getting that uh, interest that low, is it worth aggressively paying off versus possibly saving for the end? Well, e- even better then in, in that situation. Um and Bianca, what, what what do you want to do over the next couple of years? What's your do you, do you have any specific goals around flexibility or or outcomes for you? I would also like some flexibility. I enjoy my work currently, but it is very location dependent, and that's the, the thing I don't enjoy about it. I guess um, because James and I do like to travel a lot, um, so my work does not allow me to just up and leave for extended periods of time, unless I really want to impact my business. Awesome. And what happens if you do uh, uh, up and leave from that job? Is that, is, it, is there any impact on the student loan program? Yes and no, I guess, um, because it's income, income based. So my income would change drastically. Um, it would drop to zero technically. So um, I'm not sure what would happen if I were just unemployed, what that would do to my income driven repayment plan. But I don't really I don't really want to be unemployed. I like working. I like, even if I wasn't doing this, I, I'm i a busy body and would want to be doing something. I think it'd be a lot harder for us to certify that she does not have access to my uh, income or, or or my saved money if she is completely yeah. unemployed And that's as well. part of what allows my, my income-based repayments to be as low as they are. Okay. Is that we're keeping our finances so separate. Okay. That, that, that makes sense. Um, I, I'm calling this out because I, I think that when I when I look at your your position as a, at a very high level, the the student loans are are really they, they probably feel like a big you know like like the big um uh, I think you know the story here, but I, I don't think they are. I think the story is that you guys are worth 1.6 million dollars, have a cash flowing rental portfolio, and save ten thousand dollars a month, and have a very responsible debt to equity position across your overall overall portfolio in a, in a general sense. And I think that the the what I what I'd hope to do at a first point is to free you from this this mindset that the student loans are really this crutch that you that are that are that are holding back your financial position. Here's several ways to frame it. One is, y- yes, there are advantages you currently have with this, but in the worst case scenario, you have a six point eight percent student loan debt that you need to pay off, and you, you you can crush that in about two years with your current cash flow situation. Um, so you have a two year debt here. Um, from that. And you could also cash out, refinance your rental properties, 
probably at a similar debt at this point, um, uh, that, that level at this point to, to pay that off at, at any point as well. Um, so I just want to, I want to call those things out because the trade-off there of spending 19 years with this as a boogeyman in your financial profile may be very, fairly steep. Um, there, yes, that's ad- advantageous, but you may, you may not need to do that. And you may find that there's a freedom from just being rid of this thing, um, in an earlier time period. Not, not to say that's what we're going to end up on. I just want to paint that perspective because it's really not that big of a deal in the context of your financial position. It is a hu- It would be a huge deal to someone to someone else. But you're, when we combine your finances for the purpose of this show, um, you got a really really strong position. What, what, what's your reaction to, to just that observation? It comes back, I think, for me, the the math versus the personal finance side of it, right? Because like. There's a certain, it's a weight off your shoulders to think about having it paid off and having it gone, not having it sitting there and worrying about it for the next 19 years to see what happens. But then I sit down and do the math based on what the interest rate is and what we could do with that money and what the opportunity cost is. And and I feel like, well, if I could just somehow ignore and pretend it isn't there, we may end up in a much better position down the line. But down the line isn't five miles down the line. It's 19 years down the line. How much of your current job do you want to deal with so that you don't have to pay this off? I mean, I was looking at this and I saw $278,000 as a first glance. I'm like, that's a lot of money. And then I'm like, wait a second, you have 10,000 extra dollars every month and there's no such thing as extra dollars, but you have 10,000 currently unallocated dollars every month. What is 200,000 divided by 10,000? Because I think that's not that much. And I did the math on the calculator just to double check myself. That's 20 months. That's less than two years. That is then you've got 17 years to build up the biggest pile of cash you can and you still come out so far ahead without the stress. You don't have to do it for 19 years if you don't want to. Whereas if you go with the income driven repayment plan, you have to do it for 19 years and 24 years for the additional $50,000, which you could then just like knock out whatever. But I really would encourage you to sit down with the spreadsheets and like talk about your goals. This isn't a decision you have to make in the next 27 minutes while we're recording this show. It's just something to think about. Why do you want to spend 19 years at a job, very location dependent? And even though we're not sharing publicly where you live, I know where you live. And sometimes it's not the most uh, delightful to be outside where you live. So you would have to be there for 19 years or, you know, take some time off, which will further, you know, I just, I think that's something that's really worth sitting down with a calculator and a spreadsheet and a lot of different scenarios and just look at it. How could we make this happen? Could we buy another house that solely pays off these these loads? Could we buy another house that helps us, you know, figure this out a little bit more? I just think that that's really worth pursuing. Yeah. Another way to think about this is let's look at this way. You spend about 7,300 bucks a month. Um, that's about, that's a little over 80 grand a year. I'm probably doing that wrong. Someone will correct me. I'm going to do it real quick. That's uh, 87 grand a year, right? You pay off these student loans, you crush these student loans in the next two years and you just pay them off with your cash flow. You're at $2 million in net worth because you've reduced your student loan balance by that much. You're now phi at the 4% rule, right? So boom, there it is. That That's one way to, sim- to, to think about it from a simplistic standpoint to, to, to potentially reframe that. So yes, there's optimization in the student loan um, program, and we can definitely go there and talk about that with, with, with that. But I think, but my, my instinctive read on your situation, uh, if just a few minutes in is that this is the boogeyman. Um, that, that we need to, that we need to tackle. And if you, if you, if you knock this thing out, then all of a sudden you can combine finances. You can, you can think, okay, in three years, I could be sitting on a beach for six months out of the year, um, uh, in, in this beautiful location and the other six months, um, you know, uh, fixing animal backs, um, or what, what, how, uh, those types of things, uh, doing, doing what I love in, in this area. And and we're done, right? And 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 that that's that's like a freeing thing, and that's the power of personal finance and the privilege that you guys have built because of the incredibly strong financial situation that you have. This item aside, um, 
So with that, would you rather talk about, would you like to talk about that angle or do you want to talk about how to optimize the student loan debt paid off or, or both uh, next up here? I don't know. You've thrown a little bit of a, a wrench in things, right? In, in terms of, I, I guess I was coming the mindset of like, how are we going to do this the most efficiently? But you know, there is, there is something that I can't, uh, I can't quantify in the idea of it being gone. Right. Really? I agree. It, it's, 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 you can't see it in a spreadsheet. Like you tell me to look at the spreadsheets, but I can't see that in a spreadsheet, the the feeling of just not having it there. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if there's a way to set up some sort of, I mean, some spreadsheet genius that'll do this in a minute. It's not me, but have your 250 and your uh, interest payment. And I think it would be a lot like a mortgage calculator where it shows you, oh, I'm paying 10000 a month or 8000 Give yourself some buffer. I'm paying 8000 or 5000 a month towards this debt. Look at, watch this debt just go away. It's not 200000 for a super long time. It's 200000 and then all of a sudden it's only one eighty five, And that is like, wow, I paid off a lot. And then it's one seventy five, and then it's one fifty, and then it's 100 And you're like, holy cow, I just paid off so much debt. And my time horizon now isn't 19 years. It's another year, and I can be debt-free. You, you mentioned in uh, in the intro that we maybe we're sitting on a little more cash than is necessary or or that maybe we need. So you know, part of the question comes to, is it worthwhile dipping into that a bit and and running a little thinner on cash? So Because, I mean, that would make a big dent. We could make a pretty big dent right away if that's the route we went. Yeah, like a 50% dent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, now you're one year away from um, combining finances and quitting your job and living on a beach and like just with – so 105 to, – to go from 105 cash to zero cash might give you a little bit of heebie-jeebies, although you make – $17,000 a month and you spend $7,000 a month. You actually, you only spend $5,000 a month unless you're traveling all over the place. So, <laughs> I mean, look at what you could knock out. I, Gosh, I know that this is not where you were thinking this was going to go, but I like that a whole lot more. And yeah, it, you know, is it awesome to pay $200,000 when you could just spend 19 short years of your prime life working in a a place that isn't always awesome weather-wise um, when you could just have it for free. But no, I mean, what kind of stress is going to go through? What what kind of life changes have happened in the last 19 years that you didn't account for, that you didn't plan for, that just kind of happened? Like you can't predict what's going to happen in the next 19 years. Get it over with, pay it off, and then like go nuts. You look at your position. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm becoming more and more convinced that this is, this is the way I, I, I view the situation here because it's just like, it's just like this is, this is your boss, right? This is your, this is your bad boss that you have to deal with on a regular basis. That's just always there with, with this. And like, you, like I, I said two and a half years earlier, we're, we, we have one hundred ten thousand dollars in cash. So a hundred percent, like that's, that's a great option right there. You also have, you know, 401ks and those types of things that you can borrow against, um, to, to, to do that. If you want to arbitrage the interest rates just a, a little bit with that. Um, so oh. this, I mean, that could free up a lot of this and then all of a sudden now you're combining. So, so I think, I think that a good exercise here for this would be, where do you like to travel? What's your, what's your favorite place to travel to? I don't know that we have favorites. We try we haven't to picked do, a favorite yet. Yeah. We try to do different things all the time, right? Like, we're, Oh, we're how to... would you like to go to so many different places that you can finally <laughs> pick a, fla- a favorite? But, but what's, what's, what, what's one of your favorites? Is it beach, mountains? What, what's, yeah. what's your kind of go-to? Uh, I'm beach, she's mountains. So I like the beach too, though. We can say beach. Yeah. Okay, great. So this is, I, I, I've, I've now done this a few times, so I probably sound like a broken record on a couple of the recent shows, but go, go to the beach. When's your next beach trip? I guess we have to plan one. Because yeah, of we don't have one planned right now. Permission so, to plan one. Okay. Yeah. Go, go plan a beach trip and spend a few grand on, on it. Okay. A, 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 and go there and sit there and, and you know, have your coffee in the morning or whatever. What makes you, you're, 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 you know, 10, 10, 10 o'clock, you're on the beach. Someone's bringing you a coffee, maybe your first drink of the day or whatever. And then write down, like, where do I want to be in two years, three years from now? Right. Put, put three years. This is where we want to be. And just like write a half page, right? Uh, what if you if want to use a planner, you can bring a draft. Call it draft uh, on there, and I encourage the other one to 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 to, to manage that and say what I want to be in three years. And I think that that exercise will be really powerful here because you're you're thinking where do I want to be in 19 years, 
right? 19 years, life's going to be a whole lot different, right? There's going to be, there's going to be a whole different capability set that you're going to be able to, do, that you're going to have physically, uh, and going, going to all these, these places. And like, I think if you think about it in a three-year picture, a lot of this will become crystal clear and I'll be, I'll be, I'll be pretty surprised if you don't find a way to it. I, I don't know if you pay off this student loan, but to free yourself from it as a constraint in your situation, right? It could be paying it off is the easiest way. Um, but, but I think, you know, combined finances where we don't have to do this all, we, we, you know, um, Bianca doesn't have to work all, all year round for, or, or most of the year in order to qual to keep qualifying or for that to be a factor and constraint. I think that, um, without that student, without the student loan debt, um, you'll have a position that's 2 million and, or two and a half million in equities between real estate and stocks and another and, and cash and 500,000 in mortgage debt, super conservative position. That's a position that's really strong from which to start a business, for example, right? Without, without student loans over, overhanging, one income is probably going to come pretty darn close to covering all of your expenses um, from Bianca. Um, and I think your rental properties will easily cover the remainder with that. So, you know, um, I, I think that will be a really helpful exercise to come through and say three years from now, this is where I want to be. Maybe those are some starter thoughts, but only you guys can, can decide that. Um, but I would not do it from where I want to be in 20 years. Um, that's way too far out and you're, you're going to be way wrong on that. So like no one knows what they want 20 years from now, right? Mindy's laughing at me because I went too far again. You know, what, one question I have though, is we look at that and, and if that was a route we were to take, try to aggressively tackle these and, and pay them off is then it comes back to allocating where the money is going right now. Like right now I max out my 401k every year. There's slight details on mine is I have a 3% dollar for dollar match. And then at the end of the year, if I'm still employed, uh, my company adds an additional 3% regardless of my contribution. So, you know, given what our cash flow is, is it worth backing off on those contributions if we were to go this route or is, is do I still want to take those tax advantages to, to put that money away? I, I think math is math, but, the, but I, I don't think we have a math problem here. Right. I, I think we have a, a boogeyman problem with the student loan. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm using that word. I, just, I think it's funny. Um, so, but I think that that I think that's the real issue here is that this this student loan has too much power in your life um, from that. I, but I I think that that's a balancing act, right? Uh, there, there's an art to that. You you know, one one school of thought is if you chose to pay off the student loan debt to just go all in and stop everything else and 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 crush that, uh, and that's effective, right? That's a lot of pe for a lot of people that's better than a math approach for you guys. It may be, you know, I like my, my match. I'm going to take the match. There's a couple other things here. I, I, if I have a great rental property deal, I'm going to pounce on it in the meantime, uh, maybe one or whatever, because that's, that's our portfolio. And that's what we're, you know, we're obviously very proficient at, at, uh, generating income and, and, and building wealth through real estate. Um, so, so maybe there's a, a balance there. Uh, but I think that's, again, that comes down to that, like that, this exercise of just figuring out where do I want to be in three years? Do, do I want that so badly that I'm willing to just accelerate it and forget math? Um, or do I, or am I willing to take a more balanced approach to get there? Um, that's, that's right for us. So I, I don't think there's a right answer to that. Um, there will be a mathematically right answer to that. Um, but I, I, again, I don't think you have a math problem here. James, how old are you? I'm 41. And Bianca, how old are you? 35. Okay. So at that age, you still have several years before traditional retirement. I would absolutely contribute as much to get the full match as possible. Um, I think you're in such a great position. I mean, let's look at, you've got the 110K, you throw that at your debt, and now you've cut your debt essentially in half. I'm just looking at the 200s. I should also consider the 50. So- 250, now you've got uh, 140 left over. That is now 14 months of your super crazy payments. Um, I'm sure that Bianca might be able to work more hours. Maybe you could pick up, um, only if it's worth it. Like, don't do side hustles that are going to pay you an extra $5. Like, that's not worth it. But if you can find ways to generate more income, to get this paid off, I think you could do it in, I mean, 14 months. Now we're talking one year of not making um, 401k contributions. 
the market's been all crazy. So I don't know how frequently you can change your contributions. If you see that the market has just been going down, 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 maybe you do want to jump in and buy when it's on sale. Maybe you want to stick with it and say, you know what, for this next year, I'm just doing my 3% to get my total match from them. And that's all I'm going to do. And every single dollar is going to go to the debt. And then now in one year, at the end of 2023, you are debt free and you can do whatever you want. So instead of 19 years and 24 years for the 50,000, you now have to reevaluate what you're going to do in one year. And that is just, I know that's not the way you thought the show was going to go, it's not the way I thought it was going to go either, <laughs> but I'm so excited for the possibility of you being from $278,000 in debt to $0 in debt, because I don't count mortgages, uh, as in one year. Yeah, I, I think if you came in and you said, I, we're making $80,000 a year um, combined, and we're saving $400 a month um, on that, we'd be like, okay, we need to cut the spending a little bit and, and, and move, move things forward there. And then, yeah, we're going to figure out how to optimize around this, this student loan situation. It's not your reality. Your reality is that this is, this is not 10 times, you know, multiple times your income. This is one and a half times your income, um, maybe, maybe two times your after tax. Framing it in terms of one year changes a lot in my mentality in terms of like, you know, every time we've talked about it, every time we've looked at it, even the thought of aggressively paying it down, it's always been, boy, it's going to be five years. It's going to be eight years where we're going to have to skimp by and, and completely back off any lifestyle inflation we've allowed to happen. And, you know, and that's been something that's been really difficult to, to swallow for me, you know, framing in terms of, well, in, in 12 to 16 months, Starts to change that picture. Yeah, great. That's what that's what we that's our that's our <laughs> job, right? <laughs> um, as, as hopefully that's helpful. I I I I I I think that's honestly how I feel here. I, I again, I you know, it's probably going to cost you money uh, in in the sense that you could optimize your finances more by doing the, the plan you kind of came in with around how to, we're going we're going to spend. You know, we're, we're going to keep our finances separate, but I I, I think you're going to miss out on the the point of the person of personal finance, which is flexibility with this hanging over you, and and like life is going to be much better um, with, without it. So you said it's going to cost them money. It's going to cost them so much less time. They're going to get so much time back. So here, let's play some more financial monkey business. Just throwing it out there, Scott suggested you have a 401k you can take a, a loan from. I believe you can borrow up to $50,000. So now you have 105, 110 plus 50, that's $160,000. So now you're left with what? To $120,000 in debt, $160,000 you pay off right now. And now you are, what is it? $220,000, 250 160 is now you're ninety thousand dollars. Now you are paying off your loan in nine months. That's wild. What if you could do it by before next June? <laughs> what if you were debt free before next June? And is that something that you're comfortable with? Maybe, maybe not. That's a conversation that you guys have to have outside of this phone call. But that's I mean, how huge is that? Next June, you have no more student loan debt. And then, of course, you would have to replenish your, you know, your cash reserve. And there may be some things that come up. And like Scott said, if you made eighty thousand dollars a year, I wouldn't be telling you all of this. But you make a lot more. So let's say, let's go nuclear and say, okay, all four properties, the HVAC system, all blue, and the roofs all blew off. And now you need to put put stuff back on there. You have places you can go to borrow. Maybe you don't borrow from your 401k and now you're back up to the end of 2023 and all of that happens and now you can borrow from your 401k to cover that expense. Or, you know, you take 75 of this 105, 110 that you have and put it towards that and you keep a little bit more of a buffer. Is, is the reverse true here? Do, are there sources of income that could be bonuses, like a, like an annual bonus or these things that, that could come in above plan or is the cash flow in your rental properties conservatively calculated and, and could be better in the next year? Uh, the, the bonus is accounted for in those numbers that we provided. It's it's paid pretty well the last couple of years and it may be a little less next year based on how we're trending, but it's not gonna, it turns out it's not gonna be as significant less as I thought it was gonna be. So, so that's already accounted for. Uh, I think that the properties, it's reasonably conservative on that cash flow. Yeah, I think we have a little room for rent growth that we haven't completely taken advantage of. We've we've jumped up because we've taken on some new properties in the last two years, and we've been 
Uh, we've been working on getting rents to fully to market. I think we were a little too conservative on this rehab and where we came in on rents. It turns out we have one unit left, and when that's done, I think we'll get more for it than we expected. Uh, so there's some opportunity there as well. Yeah, I'm not surprised with that. When when your financial position looks like this, I'm, I'm, it makes it it, it it seems very likely that you're conservatively estimating general things um, when you've built this much cash and have this much monthly cash flow and this much wealth. James, what do you what do you do for work? Uh, I am in an administrative role for healthcare, so I, uh, I operations role where I have like a P and L responsibility for several locations that that roll up to me. So it's it, you know, it's uh, healthcare as well as it's been stressed for the last couple of years. So, which is part of the reason where, you know, again, thinking about is there something else that maybe is fun that I could do instead of uh, instead of dealing with with healthcare. And I don't know, it, it's it's tough to think about rotating out of that because it's what I've done for so many years. But uh, I, I think I've done my done my best here. What would you do instead? What, what's your what's your inkling? That's the problem. Is I I feel like I invest so much of my time into this job that. I haven't even explored the possibilities or the hobbies to really know what that looks like, uh, which is why uh, we talk about the position I want to be in. I want to be in a position where we have a lot of flexibility, knowing that likely there'll be almost no income for me for a little while till I figure out what that looks like. Yeah. That sounds like a good uh, exercise for your vacation that you're going to schedule after this, after this call, uh, <laughs> just to figure out, figure out what that looks like and, and start, start noodling on that. So <laughs> I, I think it's a hard problem, right? Because you guys, your head's down. You're, you're probably. It, it, I, I, it sounds like you're, you're, you're fairly successful at that at that role, and it's got a lot of responsibility, and it's heads down, and that's where your your mind share goes. Um, but you're like, ah, I don't know if I want to do that for the long term. I again, I, I think that going back to you know beating a dead horse here and painting the picture in two three years, this debt is paid is 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 paid off. You've stock rebuilt your cash position to fifty to one hundred thousand dollars. That's super reasonable with a two million dollar net worth. The 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 uh, the uh, uh, greenfield from there is going to look 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 pretty open to you at that point in time. So I have a comment. It's more of a uh, homework assignment for you, James. I was at Camp Mustache and somebody was giving a presentation and she said she wasn't. She was talking to a counselor and they were. She wasn't sure what she wanted to do. And they said, okay, write down the list of 100 things, 100 ways to make money. And I want to say that this came from the Sheryl Sandberg book, but I wasn't, I think I spaced out when she said that particular part. So I can't, I don't want to like not give credit, but I don't know where it came from. But anyway, so I want to give you the same assignment, 100 things that you want to do. And you're not going to put down a hundred things because you'll put down like five and you're like, oh, I can't write fast enough. And then you get to number 14 and you're like, I can't think of anything else. But just what are things you like? Do you want to go teach horseback riding or you're allergic to horses? Or do you want to go be an animal chiropractor with your wife? Or do you want to- Don't do it. You'll be in a lot of debt. Yeah. Don't don't go to school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do you want to take on another 300 grand um, to, 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 to do that? Yeah. I'm definitely not recommending that, but you could go work for her. Maybe that would help generate a lot of income that you're not paying somebody else. Um, maybe you want to learn how to knit or go skydiving or like there's all sorts of ways that you can generate income when you can think about it. Take a huge vacation. Take a whole week. A huge vacation, a whole week. (laughs) But like really think about this. What are some ways I can generate income or what are some ways that I want to spend my time when I no longer have this job? Because that like, I don't think you've even given yourself permission to think about that yet because you've got 19 years to pay off this debt. But now we're paying off your debt in nine months. Now you can think about it a little little bit more. And um, I do think that nine months is like super aggressive. I don't know that nine months is actually the right choice for you, but that's like, now you've got two things to, to start with. Here's nine months and here's 19 years. Now you can figure out where your comfortable repayment plan fits because I like I like two years, three years, way more, way more than 19 years. I love this so much. I'm so excited. I'm sending notes to our producer. I'm like, this is going to be the best show ever. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had a, we had the Life and Air guys on recently, and that might be a good read for you as well. That That's a good book that will have a, it's a short, quick read, and it has a short, little, quick perspective changing of get rid of the math problem and get, start, introduce the life problem um, with that. And, and I think that that's a, 
Oh, go ahead, Mindy. Do you own one property free and clear? Yes. Yes, we own oh one property goodness. free and clear. Could you get a mortgage on that property? Yes. It, it, th- this has been part of the conversation where I thought we were going. Uh, would have been <laughs> something like that or re- realizing I'm uh, we're really conservative as far as our, our loan to value position in general overall with real estate. I think we'd actually like to do is dump that property and leverage into something larger, but I understand where you're going, right? Like we could we could leverage that and just use that to pay off and then have our tenants pay off that loan. Have your p- tenants pay off your student <laughs> loan debt. Um, so yeah, that's and that's another thing. Like, what are the crazy things we can do to pay off this student loan debt? Because then your freedom is so tangible. It's right there. That is, and I love, I mean, we're not celebrating enough the fact that you have a fan, fantastic financial position, the fact that you are so conservative in your numbers. I really get the heebie-jeebies when people come on the show and they're like, I'm going to make $1,000 a month in this property, even though everybody else is only renting theirs for seven fifty. I'm like, you're not going to make $1,000 a month on that property. Uh, I love that you're conservative. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any properties that you don't like? I wouldn't say that I don't like, but the, the property that is fully paid off would be the property that we like the least. Yeah. It's a nice property. Like it. It's yeah. just... Yeah. yeah. Out of all out of nice, the four properties, probably. it's probably in the least favorable area. Uh, not that it's in bad area. It's just in the least favorable area. And, and we probably would dump that one before any of the others. That's another angle is you, you dump that one, buy another property that you'd like um, a, a lot. And then use the use some of the proceeds for that down payment, some of the prop, some of the proceeds for the uh, the student loan debt as well. So just re, just repositioning some of your assets. It's the same is no different than the other things that we just discussed around using your cash flow for the next couple of years. Although it's a lot harder uh, to 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 be comfortable with that concept intellectually um, or, or or in practice with that. But but that would be that would be another yet another angle here to to be able to potentially arrive at that outcome soon. You know what? What I, I think our original plan—not for student loans debt, actually—but original plan was to um, refinance the units we're currently working on once they were finished. But that was going to also be part of my questions to you: is like, is it worthwhile at this point? You know, given given where mortgage rates currently sit, and knowing that one is—I forgot what is like four four and change right now. It would be worth pulling that equity out at the end. Yeah, I, I think I think that the you know what, what do you think the mortgage rate would be when you pull it out? Probably mid to upper fives, you know, five 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 seven five somewhere in there. And so the interest rate on the, the student loan debt is six point eight, but effectively three percent. Yeah, um, because with, with the way you have that, so you're arbitraging two two hundred basis points. It's only effectively three percent if you do the student loan repayment, right? Yes, as long as we stay on that program or the 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 student plan. The re- the income based repayment plan. What would be the the cash flow of the property after you do that? I I have to do the math on that. I, I haven't haven't done that yet. Homework assignment. Yeah, I I think it's really hard because because you technically have a three percent interest rate, but you really have a six point eight percent interest rate just with the game that you're playing around the the, the finances there. So. Um, but, but I think from your life freedom perspective, I'm, I'm already mentally bucketing it as a 6.8% interest rate. So that's positive arbitrage in my opinion, because you then immediately after doing that can merge your finances and do whatever the heck you want. Um, well not almost whatever the heck you want. You're, you're like almost FI, uh, with, with, with once that's completed, you still have probably another two to three years to, to finish the, the play with your current run rate uh, on things. But, but I, I, I think that there's there's advantages in that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think you have a two or three year play to really full, fully finish the game, finish the game here with your current situation. Um, so I, I don't know. That's interesting. Would that be an owner occupied? No, no, we are owner occupying one of the properties. Uh, that's the one that's sitting at the lowest rate that you see there. Okay. I would say, <sighs> I'm not sure that you can get a five, Seven five rate on a non owner occupied property unless you've gotten a quote really recently. The quotes that I'm getting are high sixes. Oh, okay. Low sevens. Okay. Um, I'm not in the same state, but uh, they are preventing me from getting a loan on my property. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that's really hard right now. I think I think you're going to get a better interest rate as a source of debt from your IRA, and I think you're going to you you might have a better one from your personal. Residence. Could he borrow from his IRA? He has a 401k and an IRA. Can he, but can he borrow from his IRA as well? 
Because then you've got your 110 now, 50 from your 401k, 50 from your IRA. That's 210. You're practically debt free by September. Well, yeah, I still have the debt <laughs> against the IRAs, but yeah, but yeah. but you're paying that back to yourself. That's a way different debt than paying student loan debt for 19 years or working for 19 years. So just more options to think about. Well, what what are your thoughts here? What's the next? What are some other things that we can help you out with today? I know before we kind of went this direction, we were also talking a, a little bit about um, looking into bigger investment properties at some point. Um, and just, we have, we don't really have experience with anything larger than a four unit, but we, we would like to, um, and just any thoughts that you might have on that. And I want to, one thing is like, I'm fearful of creating just a new job for us, right? Like right now we're doing all the maintenance, we're doing all the, all the property management, everything. It's all us. And so it, it feels like time is tight already. And so I always have this fear of growing and figuring out systems to make sure that we're not just creating a new job on top of our jobs we already have. Well, I think that property property management is a is a great one to start. So one 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 of the one of the issues here is when when did you, what was your financial position like when you bought your first property? Yeah, so I was not far out of school at that time, so it wasn't great. You know, it, I mean, it wasn't bad by any means. Uh, I was fortunate enough to pretty much have no student loan debts myself. So I when I saved up the, the down payment, I bought the duplex that we currently live in and. That was the first property, the only property that I owned for probably 15 years. And then we just happened in the other ones really in recent history. So so he, here, here's what's going on right now. You, you earn, I would imagine, 25 k a month before taxes. Might be a little aggressive, but close. Yeah. Okay. Let's call it 250 A little less, but yeah, close to that. Yeah. Okay. We can call it 250 uh, and, 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 Okay. Well, then, we, then we have another 100 k at least in wealth accumulation from your portfolio. On average, that's going to completely wet, depend on the market conditions and other things. But on average, we can maybe expect, at least expect 100k. So, um, the, the the value of your time, if if you were an individual, right? If we were emerging as an individual, that's 350 dollars or 350 thousand dollars per year in wealth accumulation, and you divide that by 2,000 hours. Um, what is that? That's going to be uh, 175 dollars an hour. So when you started. Uh, your journey, you were not earning $175 an hour. You were earning substantially less than that, probably 20 or $25 an hour. And so it made perfect sense to do all of these things yourself, right? Rent, ma- property management, um, managing contractors, those types of things. But you have at some point in the last five, 10 years, clearly crossed a hurdle where you're probably doing too much of the work yourself and negatively arbitraging the value of your time at least at a, at a, as it's currently valued for some of these activities. And so I think that would be a really good exercise to say, what, what am I doing right now? And let's, let's cut you in half um, because you know, you're, you're two people, but what are you doing right now? That's less than a hundred dollars an hour in terms of value of time. And how do you make sure that that gets outsourced? You start hiring that out. Um, you can maybe take a tax discount and say it's 80 bucks an hour. Okay. I'm going to hire all those, uh, those items out. And when I have items that are above a hundred dollars an hour, I'm going to make sure I'm doing those personally. Um, and, and I think that will be a good mental model for you on that. And you should start underwriting your properties to that, putting that management cost, for example, into the the property analysis, especially when you underwrite uh, the, the next larger property. Um, otherwise, you're right, you're going to create, you're going to continue compounding this problem of more and more income and less and less time, um, which again, I think is is a, 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 a solution that you can solve for with your nice vacation and coming up and saying, here's what exactly what I would like my, my life to look like on a day-to-day basis in two or three years. Um, and, and you'll be able to, I think that framework will be helpful. I think so. And I think that she has opportunity with her business too, uh, on a dollar per hour average to, we should probably be looking at that too. Yeah. Yeah. That, that could be, that, that's true as well in the, um, uh, do, sorry, uh, um, Bianca, do you, do you own this business or, or do you have control over the, the income generation? Yeah. I, I own the business. Awesome. So that's perfect, right? That's a great, that's a great framework for that. Um, to to think about how to how to do exactly that 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 same activity set. I, I think it's a common problem that uh, entrepreneurs have, Bianca, where where folks are continuing to do extra like, work that is not very high value when they could be outsourcing that um, and and doing the things that are high value. So constant struggle that everybody faces when they start it when they go into business for themselves. Yeah. And a struggle to give up that control too, which is I think part of why you want to be an entrepreneur, but. Then it's hard to give up that control when the time comes to 
to take advantage of that. And the first, the first, the first time you do it, or the first couple of times, you're taking a big risk, and you might, uh, uh, you may very well uh, have it be more expensive than if you were doing it yourself. But over the long run, it will be it will be cheaper. Yeah. What What else can we help you with? Is, is did that answer your question about real estate? I mean, I think so. I, th- I think that. Uh, Part of what we were struggling with is is time management and trying to understand when is it appropriate for us to start allowing somebody else to do some of this, right? So I think that we have an exercise to look through and, and, and try to figure out when we could, or maybe now we start hiring some of that out instead of doing it all ourselves. And you're in an interesting sweet spot. You're not you're not in an area where you can do outsource everything. You're in an area where you should outsource some things and do other things yourself. Still, um, that 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 hurdle where it's obvious you should do outsource everything is you have not crossed that yet. But but it, sure. you're, you're not not too far away. I realize this might not make the podcast, but can I take a minute to celebrate uh, my wife and, and what she's contributed? Because if you look at just the numbers, like you're looking at, oh, she's <laughs> only got twenty thousand dollars, had about two hundred seventy eight thousand dollars of debt that she's brought into the relationship. And and I I want to be very clear about how she's also contributed in other ways. So you know, and in, in two aspects really. For me personally, my job I was at a crossroads probably about three or four years ago. And I could have either stayed with the company I was at and advanced or jumped to a different company. And for me, like level of comfort, you know, I'm like, I'm just going to stay where I'm at, even though I know that that company was not long for this world. She encouraged me to leave, which led to multiple relationships and changes that led me to where I'm at now. And and probably in the last three years, I've seen a 35% increase in my income based on those changes. So, you know, that that was a huge contrib- contribution alone. But also then uh, somehow with real estate, she convinced me to buy a duplex a couple years ago that was well beyond my comfort level. It was a real dump. It was a real dump. <laughs> well, well beyond my level of expertise to fix it up. And and somehow she convinced me to buy it. And with her help and with uh, some very generous family members, we did fix that one up. We ended up selling it last year, 1031 into the 40, uh, the 40 unit that we just bought, which she also identified that property through a client. So... Through both of those things, I just want to make sure I, I give her props for everything she's brought uh, financially. I, and honestly, we've we've probably turned about two hundred thousand in equity to about four hundred thousand equity in those two moves of of real estate. So, I, trying I, to I, make up for all the money it cost <laughs> you. So, thank you. I, I, I love it, and 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 and, and for, for what it's worth, I don't think Mindy or I, uh, hopefully, none of no one listening to this has had any doubt. About okay. the, the the fact that this is a partnership that that has that that has contributed to the wonderful situation that you have right now, um, and 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 you are a great couple and a great team on, on this journey, um, and you know the only reason we're looking at the finances separate is for the uh, absolutely uh, because because of the the boogeyman that we've we've identified that we're gonna we're gonna try to conquer soon hopefully. I knew the only reason you were successful was because of Bianca. <laughs> <laughs> And that's absolutely going into the show. <laughs> that's awesome. That's lovely. But yes, I think that it can sometimes seem a little impersonal with the show. We're like, hey, we're really only looking at the numbers. I could make this a 19-hour show and talk about lots of different things. I love that you celebrated her, and I love that you shared this. That's that's very, very important. And that says a lot about your relationship. It's not just, you know, wow, I think of her as this burden. She's so great. Here's all the things she's doing. I don't think of this as a financial issue at all. So yay. I love this. I am making notes all over the place. I love this show. I am so excited for this show. This is, it definitely went in a different direction and I'm so, so, so happy for the opportunities that you have. I think that it would be a lot of fun to just sit down. I am very uh, visual. So I would want to sit down with the big opportunities and okay, we can pull 50,000 from this account and a hundred from this account and 20 from this account. And we can like mix and match and be out of debt tomorrow, or we can do it a little bit slower and be out of debt in two years, or we can do it, you know, all these different ways we can do it. And just think like, how would that free up all this time? How would that free up all this mental headspace? I really think it would be fairly easy to be out of debt conservatively in two years without making a ton of changes. But you could be out of debt like tomorrow if you really wanted to pull the nuclear option without really changing a whole lot of your future trajectory because you've got $4,000 in uh, monthly income from your rentals and you've got the almost – and that's – 
let's see. Yeah, that's more than half of what you would need for your your spending. And then you've got the other half in your uh, brokerage accounts. I completely agree with Mindy. And I would just say that the three-year picture is probably the easiest one to start with because it's so believable to have it all paid off and have a strong cash position and have your 4,000 in rental income. And if you know Bianca wants to keep doing her, uh, running her business um, between the 4,000 in rental income and the income from her business, that's a, an, and easily a fifty to $100,000 cash position if you choose to maintain that or rebuild that. Um, you have, a, you have a complete freedom from there to, to consider you know, doing something entrepreneurial with an infinite runway um, so, and a nice cash reserve. So that, and that could be in real estate, it could be whenever, in whatever else your, 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 your um, exploration of your passions takes you over the next couple of years. Uh, I think that's, that's a really realistic position. And then you can just say, how do I accelerate that? Um, bit by bit, what's a, is there, is there an acceleration that I'm comfortable with that I would be willing to, to do to, to make that happen faster because you just let the current run rate happen. And that will happen to you if you just reallocate it towards that, those outcomes. This was so much fun. I'm so excited for all of the options you have. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us because this is a really, really fun show. Thank you for having us. This was really eye-opening and helpful and gave us both a lot of peace of mind, I think, to to look at it that way. Awesome. Well, send us a postcard from your beach vacation where you're going to talk about all of these things. Will do. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. Scott, that was such an awesome episode. I loved how we started down one path and then we're like, wait a second, you could just pay this off now in the next couple of years and then have you get 17 years of your life back to do whatever you want. And yes, you only can spend a dollar once. So you are going to pay off the student loan instead of buying a house. But you are only, they they have potentially the ability to repay all of these loans in like one year with all the, you know, financial monkey business that I suggested. And yes, that would put them in a slightly less than super, super secure position by using up all their current cash savings, but they make so much income. I don't really have a problem with that. Um, There are other options I would have given people in different situations. If they had three years left on their repayment plan, if they were making $80,000 a year or $50,000 a year, if they were in all sorts of other debt, but they're not. For this particular situation, I think aggressively paying off these loans is the best choice for them so that they can get this huge amount of time back in their lives. Yeah. I I, I think that the 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 ultimate goal here, and it probably comes after around two million plus in net worth. But you, like Mr. Money Mustache, has a great analogy. He says uh, the way you feel about money should be like how you feel about tap water, right? You're not going to like turn on the the faucet and waste it and all that kind of stuff. But you, you know, it's it's just a utility that you're gonna you're gonna access here. And they these guys, um, J- James and Bianca, are are so close, or should be. They're just on the cusp of being able to view money. And through that lens, they just need a little bit more work. They're almost there with their current spending. Um, and in a couple more years, they're going to easily crest that threshold um, just by paying down the student loan, for example. Um, and you, 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 you get to that point. And, and, and instead, coming into today's show, they were thinking, I've got this monkey on my back for 19 more years or 24 more years um, for, the, for the second part of the student loan debt. It's like, no, no, we can so easily just zoom out, take your whole p- portfolio, say, where do I want to get to? What's holding me back? And reallocate, right? And, and, and think through, uh, reallocate both your existing portfolio or reallocate where you're sending the cash that you accumulate on a monthly basis. Okay, Scott, that is great. I can't argue with that at all. Should we get out of here? Let's do it. From episode 338 of the Bigger Pockets of Money podcast, he is Scott Trench, and I am Mindy Jensen saying, ooh, take the money and run. Mm-hmm.